We also need to have laws against advocating violence. Anti-Semitism isn't just a Jewish issue. It isn't a left or right issue. It is a societal issue. My government pledges to embrace the definition of anti-Semitism adopted by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. An opportunity uh, to engage with the Jewish community. Social media has become the most toxic amplifier. The Australian Jewish community and its representative bodies stand with Israel. A recent report from the Executive Council of Australian Jury. Executive Council of Australian Jury. The Executive Council of Australian Jury. Executive Council of Australian Jury. Welcome to the Jewish World Podcast, where we review current affairs and major events affecting Australian and world Jewry by speaking with leading advocates for Israel and the Jewish people. My name is Alyssa and I am part of the Executive Council of Australian Jury team and I am your host today. Anti-Semitism around the world is on the rise, but also here in Australia. The ECAJ annual report on anti-Semitism revealed a 41.9% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the past two years, with a 35% increase in 2021 and a further 6.9% increase in 2022. Joining us today is the author of the report, Julie Nathan, the Research Director at the Executive Council of Australian Jury, to chat with us about the report and how we can best educate the broader community about anti-Semitism and its many manifestations. Julie has worked as the researcher at the ECAJ since 2010 and has authored the ECAJ's annual report on anti-Semitism in Australia since 2013. She is the chair of the Anti-Semitism and Racism Committee at the International Council of Jewish Women and the co-chair of the Anti-Semitism Portfolio at the National Council of Jewish Women of Australia. Julie's articles on anti-Semitism and related topics have been published in the Australian, ABC, JWire, the Jerusalem Post, Israel National News and the Times of Israel. Academics, journalists, university students and others, both Australian and international, sought information on anti-Semitism from Julie. Thank you so much, Julie, for coming here and joining us today. Uh, thank you, Alyssa, for having me. No worries. And we're going to kick off by, I'm going to hand over to you to explain a little bit about the anti-Semitism report that's been recently released and some of your findings and how that's differed from previous years. Okay, so the, the latest anti-Semitism report um, had uh, 478 anti-Semitic incidents were logged. Um, this is an increase of 6.9% uh, over the previous year. Um, it should be noted that the previous year had a 35% increase. So there was a great big jump in the previous year and then an additional increase this year. Um, so we have different categories of incidents. The, um, so we've had, let me just have a look here. So there was an increase in, in graffiti of 18%, increase in posters and stickers so of 70%. So basically the two categories that are propaganda um, categories, um, there were large increases in that. A lot of that is to do with two main factors. Uh, one is the um, anti-lockdown, anti-vaccination protests, particularly in Melbourne, where there was a lot of posters and placards, anti-Semitic posters and placards, basically blaming Jews for COVID and all, all kinds of things like that, um, as well as uh, posters and stickers from neo-Nazi organisations who have been very active over the last year um, and so putting up a lot of those. But, I mean, as well, verbal abuse continues to um, be fairly standard within um, the, the number of incidents. So there's 138 incidents of verbal abuse. Um, and then on top of that, then you have messages. So people might bring up a synagogue or send a hate email to someone. And so they also are very quite abusive as well. So, um, you know, on the, on the um, positive side, physical assaults are, are down slightly. They're always low, fortunately, very low in numbers in Australia. So that's good. Um, and so there's only five physical assaults last year. When I talk about the period, it is from the 1st of October to the 30th of September the following year. So it's not a calendar year, which makes it a little bit more complicated to say. But um, so when we talk about 2022, we're talking about that 12-month period up until the 30th of September 2022. Um, 
yeah, so incidents continue to rise. Um, and, and, and we know that a lot of incidents aren't reported. Mm. So from previous studies by the Jewish organizations, um, and that's not just in Australia, it, it happens um, across Jewish communities throughout you know, the Western world where incidents are underreported um, and also in other communities as well. So there is a, just a lot of underreporting. So the real number of anti-Semitic incidents in Australia, we don't really know. All we know is the 478 that were logged this year. Um, so they get logged and then I just go through them and, and verify um, so yeah, so it's 478. What you just mentioned about underreporting is really interesting and something that I know when I speak particularly to young people in the community is a lot of the time they don't want to report microaggressions and slight comments that are made to them because they don't know if that is considered to be anti-Semitic. Um, and I guess with the data that we get through the report, there's a lot of ways that that data can be used. It can be used to speak to stakeholders and government, and to, but also it can be used to educate the non-Jewish community about anti-Semitism, but also to build, to show the Jewish community that these things are happening. Do you think that that encourages more people to report when they read? And if we could do a better job of kind of getting this information out there about what's actually happening in Australia? I think it could. Um, I mean, I can understand people being reticent to report some, you know, minor incidents, casual anti-Semitism, because they think, well, look, you know, it's not that serious. And um, but they need to realise that, look, every, you know, they are best to report it either to, to myself directly, my emails out there, um, to the state body or to the CSG. And then we will decide. So when it comes to me, then I will decide, well, you know, is that um, an incident or not? Right. Um, and, and we need to have yeah, um, so you can't just have um, you stupid person. It's got to be something anti, specifically anti, anti Jewish, some content with that. But it is best if people do report something and then we will decide ourselves, you know, whether, you know, we will count it as an anti Semitic incident or maybe we might put it in the discourse section of the anti Semitism report. You know, um, so just to explain, the anti Semitism report has two sections one is incidents. Um, some of those are crimes and some are just incidents. Um, and then the the majority of the report is discourse, which doesn't quite rise to the level of an incident, but it's still anti-Semitism um, in, in various ways. Yeah, and that sort um, of discourse and that anti-Semitic rhetoric, particularly on social media, actually, it also allows and encourages behaviours that follow from that. I mean, it's, it's well known that... Um, when anti-Semitism is allowed to flourish, let's say on social media or, you know, in, in discourse, uh, then that often does lead to anti-Semitic incidents, you know. So it, it begins with words. There's um, Owen Kotler, Professor Owen Kotler said, you know, the Holocaust, um, you know, began with words, basically. It didn't, be, it didn't be, begin gas chambers. Um so, yeah, so, you know, words are important and that's why we have a large discourse section and that's why we also follow um, what's being said on social media or, or by politicians um, within the schools and the universities, um, by faith leaders or, or you know, so all, all kinds of people because it is important to keep a um, monitor to this and, and, and see what's going on. Yeah, and that ties in really well to my next question, actually, which a lot of the time... As you mentioned, there's we're really fortunate we live in Australia. There's a low level of physical attacks um, against Jews um, and physical anti-Semitic attacks. But a lot of the time when we're talking about that anti-Semitic discourse and that rhetoric, in my opinion, and you can disagree with me on this, but a lot of the time it comes from a place of ignorance. And one of the things that this report can do, and by having this data, we're able to use that not just to work with government, as I said before, but to educate the broader Australian community about what anti-Semitism look like, looks like. What are different ways that you would like this data to be used and how do you think we can get this information out there to the Jewish community but also to the broader community that the anti-Semitism has risen drastically over the past two years? Well, we well, firstly, we had very good media coverage this year for the anti-Semitism report. Um, some years we don't have any coverage apart from the Jewish media. Um, and, and I agree that uh, a lot of anti-Semitism, or a certain amount, is coming from a place of ignorance. Um, 
some is you know, clearly overtly hostile and others are ignorant. It's um, and yeah, but often you you can't unless you actually know the person. Uh, you you can't really judge where what the motivation is. Okay, so so the anti-Semitism report. So it's online. It's public. Um, and it gets a lot of views that way, but we also print copies, and the printed copies go to selected politicians, federal politicians, state politicians, um, you know, both government and opposition, and particularly in, in New South Wales and Victoria, uh, so that they're aware of it. It also goes to police, to 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 ASIO, federal police, particular state police um, officers. It goes to media heads, heads of media, um, mainstream media, um, to church leaders. So it, it goes to a lot of people who have influence or power to be able to make a difference. Um, often in one of the issues that we do face is when there are, let's say, anti-racism um, programs or educational things at, at schools or universities or wherever, it often doesn't include anti-Semitism or it will lump anti-Semitism in with other forms of, of racism or, or, or prejudice without any um, knowing that you know, anti-Semitism has its own particular set of attributes and motivations and, and a very long history. And so a lot of that gets overlooked. So unless anti-racism programs include anti-Semitism specifically and discuss you know how it manifests today how it's manifested in the past it's not really going to get through i mean we'll often see um you know many people will dismiss anti-semitism um you know they're often coming from a either um particularly from a let's say a left left wing or ostensibly left-wing perspective um you know, where they may see Jews as being white and oppressors and, you know, educated and wealthy. Therefore, with uh, the, the critical race theory, therefore, they see that any any prejudice or, or attacks on Jews can't be counted as racism because racism is seen as, you know, the um, so-called powerless people. Um, it, instead of seeing racism... I mean, my, my thing is racism is racism regardless of who the victim is or who the perpetrator is. You know, if someone is being targeted because of their race or ethnicity or nationality, um, that's what it is. It's, it's racism, you know, and, and you don't distinguish between whether, you know, it, it's done by, a, you know, a left winger or a right winger, another minority um, group or, or who. Um, so yeah, so education, and, and but the right education is really important. So the report um, is out there, and it, it it's well known in certain circles. Maybe most Australians are unaware of it. Um, there may be some in the Jewish community who are unaware of it, um, or have be, become aware of it, but then you know not sort of thought too much about it. Um, but it is out there, and it provides a really comprehensive view of anti-Semitism in Australia within a year. Um, and, and you could look at, you know, anyone who has any particular interest in anti-Semitism, they can pick out any particular area they're interested in, you know, with, you know, right-wing anti-Semitism, left-wing anti-Israel, um, Muslim, Christian, any forms of anti what's in the mainstream by, by politicians or in the media. So it's all in there and people can pick out what they like and, and learn something from it. Yeah, and what you just said reminds me of a saying I once heard when describing anti-Semitism is when you look at the contemporary understandings of racism today, you're always like punching down. Um, and then with anti-Semitism yeah. and the way anti-Semitism manifests often, you're actually punching up. You're saying, oh, the Jews are better than me. Oh, the Jews have more money than me. Oh, the Jews have more power than me. And there's almost yeah. like this, and until we're in that room and we can educate about the history of anti-Semitism to understand where those tropes even come from, it's like people fail to even recognize it. Um, and I think that's yeah, why yeah. one reason why the report is so important. But something else you mentioned um, is there has been a rise in the neo-Nazi outright propaganda um, in the form of graffiti or stickers. And as you mentioned before, particularly in the kind of anti-vax movement. But there also has been 
as you mentioned, anti-Semitism doesn't fall on a political spectrum. And there has been a rise in anti anti-Semitic rhetoric on the left side of the spectrum as well. How do you identify and call out anti-Semitism in that space, particularly through the report, when often it is a bit more hidden and a bit more disguised and insidious? Um, yeah, you put on something very, um, very important because neo-Nazi, white supremacists, or the, the extreme right-wing anti-Semitism, it's overt, everyone recognises that it's basically kill the Jews type of, type of rhetoric. Um, on the left, it's very different, or or the uh, ostensible left, um, because they, it, it's much more veiled. It's much more using code words for Jews, such as um, you know Rothschilds or Zionists, and and it's always difficult to so so often Jews will recognize it, see something, recognize it as anti-Semitic. But then you actually then once you have to start to explain why it is anti-Semitic because it is so coded, um, then it kind of makes it much harder to to explain um, or or to get people to accept that it is anti-Semitic, and and that's the thing because that um, I guess that left-wing anti-Semitism is often so coded, um, but it, but it's there, you know. I mean, for example, let's say take an incident of um, anti-Israel graffiti. Now, if, if that happens to be just somewhere in the street, okay, that's that's anti-Israel graffiti. We don't count that as anti-Semitic. Um, however, a lot of anti-Israel graffiti or, or stickers will be will specifically target Jews. So you might have anti-Israel graffiti opposite a kosher shop um, or on the home, on the, or the fence of a, a Jewish resident. Um, you may have stickers, anti-Israel stickers, put on kosher food in a supermarket. So those are clearly anti-Israel activities, specifically targeting individual Jews or the Jewish community in general. Um, so that's any anti-Semitic. Um, but yeah, generally it, it, it can be difficult to explain um, or once you have to start explaining why something is anti-Semitic, it just makes it much more difficult. So we ourselves can often identify it, but how do we need to teach others? This is, you know, how to identify that um, so-called left-wing anti-Semitism. And on that, I found, I guess, it all comes back to why the report is so important and data and reporting these sort of incidents, whether it's a microaggression or like, God forbid, a much bigger attack. It's that the way to educate some of these people is by understanding anti-Semitic tropes and how they've manifested over time as well. Because as you mentioned, when you look at some of the stuff we do see in um, anti-Israel rhetoric that crosses that line into anti-Semitism, it's a perpetuation mm. of these tropes that existed a thousand years ago and are now just existing in a different manifestation. And I guess that's really why one of the reasons why the report is so important. You mentioned before that the report goes to government and key stakeholders, whether that's state, federal, um, different faith leaders, what, whoever they may be. What is your one takeaway um, or one policy ask you would like for governments to take from this report? Um, for governments? Um, one, one, one takeaway is probably one. a little difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I guess... Well, I recently did an article on this, and basically, it's there's there's three. So we want the right messaging from leaders, you know, political leaders, um, union leaders, academics, faith leaders, that to condemn anti-Semitism, to understand what anti-Semitism is, to condemn it and say, look, you know, this is not acceptable in Australia, and, and to also realise that when Jews are constantly being attacked, it actually undermines liberal democracies, such as we have in Australia. Um, but it's also important to have effective laws, which is also something that politicians can do. Um, you know, laws against advocating violence. So there's laws against advocating, uh, against inciting violence, but not advocating violence. Um, you know, and then again, the education. So it, it's, Anti-Semitism, there's no one kind of prong, you know, as you probably realise yourself, there's a multiple prong um, response to, to combating anti-Semitism. Um, but, but yeah, if we get the right messaging, I guess, for, for number one, that would be go a long way to once we get the message that anti-Semitism is wrong, needs to be combated, needs to, needs to be fought and countered. 
um, then the rest should follow. Yeah, and on that point as well is I think the recognition that anti-Semitism exists is also really important um, because yes. there are a lot of people who genuinely believe that anti-Semitism started and ended with the Holocaust and with Nazi Germany. But when you're in the Jewish community and you have an understanding, at least, of the Jewish community, you know it existed long before that and it still exists today. And sometimes mm. even recognizing whether that's by particularly by academics, university leaders, faith leaders, union leaders as well, not just politicians, um, recognizing that there can be anti-Semitism in their spaces and the spaces they're around is also really important and goes a long way to show the Jewish community that their concerns and what they have experienced are heard. So, so what you've said about um, the, the Holocaust, so the fact that people deny that anti-Semitism exists, they see anti-Semitism only in the terms of the Holocaust, as in, you know, they see it as yellow stars, um, cattle trains, gas chambers. And they ignore anything less than that. So when Jews are discriminated against, or when Jews are physically or uh, verbally abused in the streets, um, the fact that the Australian Jewish community has to have massive security around our communal facilities so that Jews can go to synagogues and Jewish schools um, and other Jewish facilities to be safe. And then we have, you know, the, the security, the, the armed guards, um, high fences, um, CCT cameras and the like. Um, and we don't do that for the fun of it, you know. So it's it's there. Um, even Australian police recognise that the Jewish community needs those um, processes to, to be able to protect ourselves or to be somewhat more protected than otherwise. Yeah, and it's a really good point you make about people not recognising anti-Semitism that's, that's lesser than that. Um, yeah. because especially that's lesser than the Holocaust and especially when especially with what I read online in particular like there's a lot of comments made about Jews and the political lobby and Jews in power and those sort of mm. we touched on it earlier but those sort of comments and those words feed into thousand year old anti-Semitic tropes but they also encourage behavior that can come from that and almost justify behavior that can come from that the last thing I wanted to touch touch on which I know you do mention in the report and you use it as a guide to help particularly when it comes to those sort of coded forms of anti-semitism is the IHRA the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-semitism and it's something that at the moment is we're really speaking about as a way to define our experiences as Jewish people and our experiences of anti-semitism and particularly given anti-semitism has risen so much over the past two years in Australia and as we said it can be really difficult for people who don't under, have an understanding of the community or may not have Jewish friends or even have seen anti-Semitism in the way in that clear cut way to identify what anti-Semitism can look like. So I want to hear from you how you use IRA in the report and also how you think the data from the report can kind of guide that conversation around IRA as well. Um, yeah, so the, the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism is quite old. So it was developed originally about 2005 with the European Union and then it kind of got a little bit of work done it and um, came up with the um, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance who then, you know, officially adopted, took it on. Um, so it's important because it's, it's, it provides some examples where it can be difficult to know um, what's anti-Semitic and, and, and what's not. So most Jews will kind of understand this is anti-Semitic, this isn't, right? Or this is offensive, this is, you know, it's un distasteful, but it's like, you know. Um, and, 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 and unfortunately, the IRA definition has um, become controversial by a lot of the anti-Israel um, lobby. And so they're really pushing for everyone to, for no one to adopt it, right? For Not for governments, not for local councils, not for universities, Um you know, they because they see it as they they misrepresent it. They say it says you cannot criticize the state of Israel. Well, the IRA doesn't say that. You can criticize the state of Israel. And most Jews and Jewish organizations recognize that just like any government or any state, you know, um, you can criticize it, right? Whether it's Australia or Israel or, or, or wherever. Um, and that's important, that's part of democracy. Um, what the IRA definition does is explains how when it crosses the, the line, 
mm. when and um, there's been previous work done on this by um, Alan Dershowitz and Natan Sharansky, who are also included, their short articles on this are also included the anti Semitist report. So the difference, so the issue is when does something critical of Israel or Israeli government or Israelis or Israeli policy? cross the line into anti-Semitism. And, and it explains it. And, and we know because when they start using tropes from 100, 1,000 years ago, then that's anti-Semitic, right? If you want to criticise Israel, the Israeli government, go ahead. But you don't have to um, go into anti-Semitism on that. Um, and so that's where IRA is important. And... Um, you know, there's only 11 examples, and I think five, five or six relate to Israel, but it does give a guideline, um, and there are probably a lot more examples that could be added in, but for some reason they chose to use these particular ones, and it was very carefully thought out um, over many years, this this um, definition. Yeah, and it, the definition also states clearly um, that anti-Semitism could look like taking into account the overall context the following examples and, exactly yeah and i was wondering with the data that you get from this report there is a need and a push and something we speak about a lot is the importance of these institutions adopting ira as a form to guide their existing policies recognizing that anti-semitism is a little bit different and a bit more nuanced and a bit more difficult to pin at to pin down and understand than some other forms of discrimination and racism mm. um how do you think or how would you like for the data for the report to be used to kind of in those conversations about why IRA is important? Well, um, yes, I mean, they are, people only have to look at the report to see what we are counting as anti-Semitic. Um, and, and even in the anti-Israel chapter, um, you will find the examples that are included in there, for example, um, comparing Israel or Israelis to Nazis, right? So that's clearly anti-Semitic. Um, other examples in the report, um, well, other other examples where they claim that it, it it's an, that we claim that it's anti-Semitic, they're not in there. So you know, because it's it's. Um, only the ones that cross the line into anti-Semitism. Often we do use, in, in the report, we often do state um, which particular examples um, from the IRA definition that a particular statement um, is covered under. Um, and, and so that, that is to explain, um, you know, where, where the anti-Semitism is, is coded um, and using older tropes against Jews even though they might be using the word Zionists or Israelis or whatever. Um, so then we use that to, to explain to people why that is that particular content is anti-Semitic. Yeah. And I think we've seen, I mean, I personally seen it in my own life, like people switching out the word Jews or um, Jewish people for all the other code words we mentioned before and still peddling those same sort of anti-Semitic tropes. And I think that's also why the report is so important and it's so important for everyone to read to it lays out really clearly what what's happening in Australia and really what anti-Semitism looks like in Australia, but also ties into why the I the IRA definition of anti-Semitism is so important. But I'd like to thank you so much for your time today and for coming to have a chat with me and for all the work you've done on the report and for the Australian Jewish community. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Alyssa, for having me on and, and having this this conversation and uh yes i do hope that people have a look at the report it's on the ecaj website ecaj.org.au so and it's publicly available it is 282 pages but easy read. there is an inter <laughs> yeah yeah there's a contents at the beginning so you can kind of pick which bit you want to read if you you know you only just want to yeah but uh no thank you for having me on and um Yes, no, it is important that this report um, is done every year and is um, you know, provided to those people in, in Australia with, with influence or, or power to help the fight against anti-Semitism. Thank you so much for listening to The Jewish World. 
Make sure to subscribe and follow the Executive Council of Australian Jury on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or TikTok to stay up to date.